in the chambers below the Sphinx and the Pyramid of Giza. Ground penetrating radar was deployed in Egypt in 1978, mapping an extraordinary subterranean complex beneath the Egyptian pyramids. Arrangements would be made with then President Sada of Egypt. This would result in over three decades of top secret excavations attempting to penetrate the system. At a meeting in Australia in the 90s, one of the key scientists on the Giza project, Dr. Jim Hertak, would release film footage of the excavations. This footage would come to be known as Chambers of the Deep. It was supposed to be released at the end of the 20th century, but of course it wasn't and still hasn't been released to this day. The film would reveal a vast megalithic metropolis reaching several levels below the Giza Plateau. This would be called the City of the Gods. The buildings matched our largest cathedrals and the technology just wait. They figured this civilization to be 30,000 years older than you then proceeded down a tunnel towards the Sphinx when it suddenly veered off. At this point, we knew it couldn't have been built by the giants, but instead, the reptilian race, as they would find one of their skeletons down there. It was obvious there was some sort of battle there at the time, and he was left for dead. The tunnel was then sealed and its entrance hidden. We would make our way through and it opened up to a very large room. It was here we would find stacks on stacks of large metal tablets, written in an ancient language. Well, how do you read the language? I proclaimed to the lieutenant. Exactly. We couldn't figure it out. We figured there should be some machine that would read it for you until a scientist would press vertically on one. That's when, at ground level in front of the tablet, a hologram projected. The hologram would sit quite high off the ground and display a corner of the universe. It was very detailed and showed the process and the rotation of a star cloud. Me and the others would sit there and watch it for two hours. It was recorded as if they put a camera in the universe for 100,000 years and played it back in high speed. America would have needed more than a year to process and release the information to the public. You could easily have sat there and watched that one tablet for thousands of hours. I was then taken to a different chamber where displayed was a two meter high crystal. It was a perfectly carved pyramid with several faces. This crystal was so beautiful and pure, you could almost see right through it to the wall. The lieutenant looked at me and said, I left this discovery for the end on purpose. And you should know that I never knew about the crystal either. And it wasn't until I connected it to the other machine that a space-time distortion was activated. This device can project you in time. You can't interact because your body stays here. Astounded, I gulped nervously. Then I asked the question that I had been too nervous to ask the entire time. Tell me, Lieutenant, those who built this place, did they come from outer space? There was a brief moment of silence. Then Caesar looked me straight in the eyes. I can tell you they're a very advanced civilization that want to help humans very much. And that during those times, the population of the world was very different, and the land masses as well. Back then, they handled problems differently. Well, what solar system are they from? Are these the ones that collaborate with our government? Nope, not even by far, Caesar said. These extraterrestrials and the ones the Americans collaborate with are the difference of night and day. And what's even more troubling is these beings are not even from our galaxy. Wait, wait a second, how do you know all this? I thought they left no proof of their origin. You're right, but then we discovered this. Caesar would then show me the pedestal on which the semi-transparent cylinder was placed. Okay, but I know it's just a replica of the one in the projection room. Yup, you're right. Two years ago, we didn't understand what the one in the projection room was meant for. But this one is built for our height. You could essentially call it a time machine. I'll tell you some of the time projections I achieved using this device, which is based on a very advanced technology. I saw him speaking to a crowd. And he usually liked to stand in front of everybody, especially if that crowd was a large one. His vibe was intoxicating. What the Bible depicts pales in comparison to what he actually manifested. He was actually much shorter in person and his nose much wider at the base, but he resonated with the people. They loved to hear him talk. I projected as soon as he started giving his speech. And as soon as I did, he looked up at me, acknowledging my presence. Too controversial? Check my YouTube for more. All right, y'all, Chambers of the Deep, Secrets of the Sphinx. So after the lieutenant shows the doctor all the tablets, the projection room, and the time traveling machine, he proceeds to tell the doctor the story of how he time traveled to watch Jesus, explaining that when he got there, Jesus actually made eye contact with him. As he was listening to him in spirit or soul form, he was astral traveling more or less. So this is where it starts to get a little controversial. He follows Jesus all the way up to his crucifixion. And the claims he makes in the process are astounding. His first claim, and one of his most controversial, was the fact that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were much closer than people believed. And that with him and the 12 disciples, 
was Mary plus two other women. It gets kind of crazy. This is where he says they openly did actually have sex. This includes Jesus. You can see all the blasphemy comments now. But he proceeded to say that the Vatican even knew about this. That it said in some of the original scripture of the Bible that they would only tend to do it when they were nearby water. And that Mary and Jesus were very exclusive. But they did lay. Along with the other two women, Mary's friends, being exclusive with two of the other disciples. But when the Vatican found this out and actually read it in the original scripture, they had a vote. The vote was based on whether or not they should include this in the future written Bibles. Or should they just make Jesus abstinent? Caesar, the lieutenant, goes on to say that the vote was very close. But it won on the abstinent side. And I can kind of understand why. You have kids going to church. And as humans and society, we have a hard enough time regulating sex as it is. And last but not least, the crucifixion. It goes per usual, except in real life, he had no help carrying his cross. It even got so bad at one time, the crowd was throwing so many stones at him, he couldn't even move forward. So the guards had to intervene, pushing the crowd back and letting Jesus get back up. They would almost have to escort him all the way to the cross. And once there, everything went pretty normal. Forgive them for they know not what they do, Father. The history as far as those accounts, accurate. Until the end, when they puncture his chest with the spear of destiny. As soon as this happens, a loud thunder booms in the sky. The crowd looks up and sees lightning striking throughout the cloud. It begins to rain very hard, and then suddenly, two large crafts come out of the sky. They lower to above Jesus and send a frequency wave. This frequency scatters the crowd. And there's actually much more to this story, and I'm going to continue on. But that pretty much wraps up what happened at the Pyramid of Giza. The journal would go on to talk about how the tunnels were connected all over the world. Giza was connected to both Tibet and Romania. And Romania actually has its sphinx of its own. And in fact, as early as World War II, Hitler and his Nazi army actually found the tunnels in Tibet. But when they entered them, they got massive headaches and actually had heart attacks. But all three of these places had projection rooms, and it was set up very similar to the Pyramid of Giza. They also had an entry to Middle Earth, and the tablets would go on to explain that there's actually four types of humanoid Homo sapiens species in Middle Earth being preserved right now. We are the fifth, and it is our turn to inhabit the planet. The odd thing about it all is they said there was seven total. So recently, one of my followers messaged me on TikTok. I always try to check my messages because a lot of times followers will provide me with good content. And this particular follower had a crazy story. He lives and works in Ontario, Canada. And this just happened within the last couple days. He'd explained that his job brought him to Eagle Lake, which is located right here. But as he was working, it wouldn't take long for him to notice something odd. He'd noticed that the Canadian military had been flying over the lake for hours, which is weird because the nearest base was over five hours away. So he couldn't help but do a little digging, and what he would find out? Absolutely crazy. After talking with a few of the locals, he'd discover that people were being bitten by a giant lake serpent. He'd even shown pictures of attacks that had happened in the last couple of years. And in the same time frame, there's been one documented death and three to four undocumented deaths. So down the rabbit hole I went, and here's what I'd find. The sightings would start back in 1805, when four fishermen were in Lake Ontario near Kingston. This is when they would spot what they thought was an overturned rowboat bobbing in and out of the water. So naturally, they would begin approaching it to see if they could help. But as they neared the object, it would begin ominously coming towards them. The beast would soon be close enough that they could see it was part of a much larger creature. While rowing for their life, they would notice its massive eyes sitting on a much larger head. These fishermen estimated it to be 60 to 80 feet long and as big around as a barrel. They would eventually make it to shore and the beast would swim back and forth, taunting them. This story would go down in history and from then on, a number of sightings would occur, each having different descriptions of what they encountered. And when these European settlers asked the local natives what it was, 
They refer to it as Gaciendata, meaning the water dragon. In the Buffalo Morning Express in 1897, it is said someone captured one by hook and line, just off of Tompkins Point. The harrowing battle took place over a seven-day stretch as they pulled the rope in foot by foot. They'd refer to it as a leviathan, and it measured over 17 feet long. They stated that the body was encased in a shell that was soft and pliable, and they weighed it on coal scales at 443 pounds. Its head, three feet long, and it contained the jaws of a monster. Its tail, four feet long and feather-shaped, and in the midst of its back was an 18-inch hump that, when cleaned off, glimmered in the sun. The serpent had six fins or flippers, each measuring at 32 inches, and they had claws. Sightseers were driving from miles around to see it, and supposedly Dr. D. Burrow would have it mounted, but no one has ever located it. After this, there would be a number of sightings in the 1900s. Part 2. The Legend of the Great Lake Serpent, Part 2. The sightings would claim that the beast ranged anywhere from 40 feet all the way up to 150 feet. Some of the witnesses would claim that it was blue in color, while others would say it was brown, male, female. And one of the last sightings that took place until recently was 1970. After that, it lied dormant for almost 40 years. That is, until a Reddit user would claim to sight one near Toronto Harbor. User Javantor would state that he and his friends were at a concert on the night of September 5th, 2011 at the Toronto Docks. They would describe it as being black, maybe two to three feet wide, and it slithered over the surface, but never jumped out of the water, exposing its large fin. They saw it three times in the 30 minutes before the concert. Then once again, it would lie dormant for 10 more years, until recently, when it would turn up at Eagle Lake. Now originally, most of the sightings had taken place in Lake Ontario, but apparently locals had been spotting them in Eagle Lake for years. Now, Eagle Lake is mostly known for the muskie or lake sturgeon, which are some of the largest freshwater fish you can catch. And they even have been known to bite people once in a while. But this follower stated he looked at pictures of the recent bites and muskie bites. And the recent bites are two to three times larger than any muskies seen. And even though Eagle Lake is quite a distance from any of the Great Lakes, they do actually connect. So my theory is since Eagle Lake is full of these large freshwater fish, the beast relocates there to feed. And they may even do this for years, getting ready to breed or hibernate. And what's even more interesting, the local natives, the Algonquin and Seneca mythology states that they came in on a meteor and that they've been here for thousands of years roaming the Great Lakes. I'll leave you with this video. Let me know what you think. All right, fam, now this is just a hunch, but I think I figured something out. You know me, I was up last night looking at some Google Earth. And if you haven't already noticed them behind me, notice the lines, perfectly straight. Since I started Google Earthing, I've been noticing them all over the ocean floor. And I've always been told they're just drag lines from ships. So I just ignore them, but I got to looking at them. And they're always in perfectly straight lines. And that got me to thinking, if it was a ship in a drag line for fishing, it wouldn't be perfectly straight. With the currents and the waves and everything going on in the ocean, the boat gets tossed around often. And not only that, with all the anomalies and the mountain passes and all that on the ocean floor, the nets would get thrown off. They wouldn't be perfect. And then I got to thinking, God, these look like they're pretty good size for the scale of Google Earth. So I measured one. They're four miles wide. So naturally I thought, well, a road system, right? But if it's a roadway, 
Why do they take such sharp angles? And why do they go out of their way over here when the shortest distance between two points is a straight line? They just cut straight through. And when I say these run everywhere, fam, they're all over the world. It's only on the ocean floor, though. Through mountain passes. Perfect. Zigzag. The Red Sea. Boom. Up. So naturally, I started following them. And a lot of times, they'd converge into one spot. And this is what these spots would oftentimes look like up close, like a grid. And here's another one, up close, like almost like a grid, like a town. So I continued to follow them. Eventually, it led me to the Azores Islands. And if you look closely, it comes into the Azores Islands. There's three, two, three. What look like roadways coming off of it. So it's a hub of some sort. And those of you that watch my videos know that I pointed out the Azores Pyramid, which was bigger than the Pyramid of Giza recently discovered underwater. And that's when it hit me like a freight train fan. When I was originally exploring the Azores Pyramid, I stumbled upon this. Here's what it looks like zoomed in. What are those? A piping network. Now some of y'all are gonna think I'm crazy, but I'm gonna prove it. These are canals. Yes, you heard me right, a network of canals. Canals built by an ancient civilization to distribute water on Earth, part two.